Good morning, everyone. We have an exciting lesson today again. This one is on nuclear chemistry. We've been talking about how, um, how atoms are made up of, of three subatomic particles, um, the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. And we've um, learned that the protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus of, it, of an atom, which is like this, this tiny, tiny little space that is positively charged from the protons. And that contains virtually all of the mass of an atom because that's where the protons and neutrons are which is which are the the subatomic particles that contribute a significant amount to the, to the mass whereas all the electrons are on on the occupy the bulk of the atom on the outs, outside of the nucleus so our topic today is nuclear chemistry which is what happens in the nucleus hence nuclear chemistry we've seen that there were alchemists three, four, five, six hundred years ago, um, even, even more, that were trying to uh, transform some base metals, some lesser metals, into gold. And they were doing this because of, of the, um, the properties of gold, which they thought um, included you know, curing diseases and, and um, ensuring afterlife and providing immortality and, and whatnot. So gold was, was very sought after, much more than, than for its, its monetary value. Right? Um, and they were not um, able to, to transform uh, or transmutate uh, lead into gold. But what it would look like today is this, or could look like today, is, is this nuclear reaction that you have in your notes here. Whereas we would have this isotope of lead uh, lead 204, let's say we started with, and this process uh, would be triggered, say, by a neutron, and so this neutron would be, uh, would be our trigger, right? what would initiate um, this process of transmutation. In chemistry, when we see this arrow, the arrow represents the transformation or the reaction itself. So what's to the left of the arrow is what you start with, right? Your reactants or the substances that you begin the process with. On the right side of the arrow are the products or what comes from um, the reaction. So following the reaction, this is what you have. So generally, this is how we, um, we write things. So we have the before on the left, we have the reaction itself, transformation, and then we have after. So we see that whereas we started with our triggering neutron, and so this, this little neutron would come in and, and hit this, this isotope of lead 204, and then it would, it would trigger this nuclear, um, this nuclear transformation, this nuclear reaction. On the other side, we get lead, uh, we get gold, sorry. And then we could possibly get these two alpha particles, which we're going to talk about in the next class, as well as a beta particle, um, also the topic of the next class. Look at this reaction um, carefully. And I would like you to, um, to tell me what you notice about the mass and the protons. You know how we've been um, writing um, atomic symbols with the number of protons and the mass of, of the substance. So look at, look at what you can see here from before the reaction and then after the reaction. And write down your thoughts in the box right here. So the arrow represents the process. To the left is before, to the right is after. Look at the protons and the mass and write down what you see. Pause the video. So what we do notice is when we look at before and after the reaction, whereas we have, um, we have the symbol and we have the protons or the atomic number and we have the mass number. And we see that before the, the, the transformation, before the nuclear reaction, the mass was one plus 204. So the total mass before was 205. 
then we had the transformation. On the other side, we've got 197, we've got a four, another four, and a zero. So 201, 205. The mass number hasn't changed. We can look at the number of protons. Before the reaction, we had zero and 82. So we had a total number of 82 protons. On the other side, we have 79 and a two and a two and a negative one for a total of 82. So the charge hasn't changed, right? The nuclear charge is still at 82 and the weight, the, the mass of it all hasn't changed either. So even though the appearance is completely different, what we do notice is that during these processes, the most basic particles inside the atoms, inside the nucleus, the nuclear charge and the mass have not changed despite the particles themselves changing. So what we could say is that the arrangement of the particles has changed. But the particle themselves, the charge and the mass, have not. So the study of nuclear chemistry is a fascinating topic, absolutely wonderful, has many applications in, in daily lives and in, the environment, uh, the political landscape, uh, medicine, history, it touches everything. Um, so nuclear power, obviously, um, generating electricity um, from, from nuclear sources um, has advantages and disadvantages, of course. Um, nuclear weapons, Archaeology, so the use of isotopes in determining, for example, the age of certain artifacts, um, that's using uh, nuclear chemistry. Uh, radiochemistry would, um, has important applications in, in medicine um, where we can um, put tracers inside your body uh, to study metabolism. We can uh, use uh, radiation to treat cancer. Um, and, and also cos uh, cosmochemistry, so the study of the cosmos itself um, has applications in, in nuclear chemistry. So, so where, is this, um, where is this transformation? What initiates, what triggers uh, this transformation in, in, in nuclear um, processes? What we need to do is to look at the nucleus a little bit and understand that inside the nucleus, there's there, there are two competing forces. And these two forces inside the nucleus, they're, they, they're generated from the particles that are in there. And so there's gonna be a repulsion force, which we've already talked about, is generated from like charges. So um, when you have two positive charges, so these two positive charges are going to repel each other. So they push apart because they have the same electrical charge. Right? So there's an electrostatic force, a coulombic force um, of repulsion that exists inside the nucleus. So if you're thinking about the nucleus being a place infinitely small where protons are, are, are jammed together so close, you might be wondering how, how is this even possible because the protons are, are pushing apart so how can we get them to be so close together? There's gotta be something else. In fact, there is. And this is the strong nuclear force or the strong interaction. And the strong force, which essentially occurs in the nucleus of atoms, is the most powerful of the four forces that we have um, 
in the universe where we have gravity, electrostatic, magnetism, and the strong force. Now these forces, as you understand, is the furthest reaching they are, the weaker the force is. So for example, where gravity is, is very far reaching, right? So the sun has gravity on the earth and, and these obviously are two bodies are very, very far apart. So gravity is a force that reaches a very long distance, which makes it a weak force. Oppositely, if you think about the same reasoning here, if a force acted upon a very small distance, then it would be very, very strong. So the longer the distance, the weaker the force, the shorter the distance, the stronger the force. And this is where um, the strong force comes into play. In the nucleus of atoms, um, because the, the distance between the particles and the nucleus is so small, there is a force of attraction there, which is immensely powerful. And this is called the strong force. So the strong force is a holding force. It binds things together like gravity. So it's strictly pulling, right? Whereas the electrostatic force, in the case of two protons, is a repulsion force. So we have a repulsion from the electrostatic force and we have an attraction from the strong force. So generated by the presence of, of neutrons. And so these two forces together are going to hold a nucleus in somewhat of a harmonious existence. Two protons together would be repelling each other from the electrostatic force. But if we join them with two neutrons, that would generate strong force. And so we would have a balance occurring here between the two. So we have the um, electrostatic repulsion, which is trying to get the protons apart. And we have the strong force, which is an attractive force. And if these two are in balance with each other, then we have a stable nucleus. However, you see here, if there is an imbalance in the force, if there's a disruption and inequality between the repulsion and the attraction, we're gonna have a problem. The nucleus is either going to explode, it will, fall, it will just separate from the repulsion force if we don't have enough neutrons or too many protons. But the opposite is also true. Whereas if we put in too many neutrons, then there will be an implosion. There will be the force, the, the crushing, the attractive force is gonna be so strong that, that the nucleus will be crushed on itself. So we can have either way, a nucleus that is not stable. And this is what we call radioactive. Think about what we've learned in the past about the number of protons and the number of, of, of neutrons. And we've learned about isotopes and you've heard before like radioactive isotopes. And this is where it comes in because an isotope is a substance that has 
more or less neutrons, right? Where we would have, say, for example, a, a carbon-14 isotope would be a carbon atom, which would have eight neutrons. That would be too many neutrons. So that would create an instability in the nucleus of a carbon-14 from having too many neutrons. But also the reverse is also possible, where if you had, if you had an atom that had too few neutrons, then the repulsive force of the protons couldn't be, couldn't be offset, it couldn't be contained, because there's not enough neutrons generating enough strong force. So the nucleus is gonna fall apart. Either way, we have a radioactive isotope. So if there's an imbalance in forces, and this is going to re generate radioactivity. And to measure this imbalance in the force, to measure to what extent there is an imbalance in the force, we use the half-life. So the concept of half-life is a measure of time, and it's how much time it takes for half of the nuclei that you have to disintegrate. If you think about the imbalance in the force and how this relates to the half-life, you see that if an element, if an isotope has a very long half-life, it means that it takes a very long time for this nucleus to fall apart, which means that the forces have to be almost in balance, almost equal. And because they're so close to, to being offsetting, it takes a very long time for these nuclei to disintegrate. Now, some elements, some isotopes of, say, uranium, for example, have a half-life in millions of years. So it takes a very long time for these nuclei to decompose. There's some isotopes of other elements, though, that have a half-life that is measured in hours or minutes even, seconds. We would, you could have a, a, a francium isotope, which would have a half-life of only 20 minutes. So the shorter the half-life is, it means that there's a greater imbalance in the nucleus. And, and the forces of, of repulsion from the protons and the attraction from, from the, the strong force of, of the, the neutrons, these forces are so uneven that the nucleus are falling apart very, very rapidly. And that's what the half-life is about. Whereas carbon-12 is a very stable isotope. And if you think about the ratio of protons to neutrons, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Six protons, six neutrons, because carbon-12, the carbon atom, is number six. So you have a one-to-one -one ratio, protons to neutrons. But when you get to carbon-14, carbon is still six. Now, all of a sudden, your ratio is six to eight protons to neutrons. And this is where, there's, this is what generates an imbalance in the forces. And this will trigger um, a nuclear process, a beta decay, which we're gonna cover in the next um, lesson. But so this is radioactive. Now the half-life of this, um, carbon-14 is about 5,700 years. And we have polonium-210 at 138, um, iodine-131 eight days, and francium-22 minutes. So what it means is that if you started with a certain amount of francium, 22 minutes later, 
you'd only have half of that amount left. Now remember, this half didn't disappear, it just transformed into something else. So one gram of francium. 22 minutes later, and we would have only a half gram of francium. Waiting another 22 minutes, then we would also have half of that. The half-life is always half of the previous amount. So then we would have 0 0.25 grams and so forth. Every 22 minutes, your amount of francium divides, in, divides by half or becomes half. So what are your thoughts here? Based upon what we just said, which of these isotopes is the most stable isotope and which one is the most unstable isotope? You now have enough information um, to look at some um, half-life problems. And I hope that this lesson was helpful to you in understanding um, the nuclear forces and uh, radioactivity. Have a great day.